just start it right now. Okay, go All ahead. Right. Karen Spader, can you start off? Um, I'm going to restart my machine because I've been dropped twice now. Okay. And so in avoidance of doing it again, I'm going to okay. pop on pop back in. Thanks. Okay. All right, everybody. So welcome. Uh, so today's topic is assessment strategies. I'll start with that. Um, I'm wondering if real quick we could get a show of hands of who was able to either make it in person or watch last week's recording of uh, this topic. This would have been Friday. Okay. If you don't know where the hand is, it's in the middle bottom of your screen. Little guy down there. Okay, so only a couple of people were able to make it, it seems. That's not a problem. So to kind of, um, these first couple slides before I jump forward, I should say, uh, just in case you have any questions about where functionality is in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, um, if you're not seeing the chat panel or the Collaborate panel on your right, this little purple tab in the bottom right will open it. Um, and then you can post to chat and people will communicate with you. And we'll also show you this annotation tool uh, in a few minutes, but then you can turn on your mic and your video if you want to talk as well. So uh, just to kind of review last week, since many of you weren't with us last week, uh, we talked about five top tips for each of the four major topics that we're, we're covering in the active teaching labs. So this topic is assessment strategies, we also have improving the remote student experience, uh, better asynchronous collaborations, and lecturing and alternatives, really kind of highlighting audio video concerns and topics. So that's what we did last week. We kind of went through those five top tips. And people have been sharing in the uh, chat the link to the activity sheet. And on that activity sheet, you'll find those five top tips if you want to look back to those. So our goal with these active teaching labs is to be responsive to the needs of our faculty and instructional staff and um, also kind of to address overall university needs. So we are intentionally kind of adjusting these week by week based on the things that we're hearing, the conversations that we're having. So to get things rolling last week, we kind of presented these five top tips um, and interacted with everybody answering questions. And now this week, we're kind of taking a turn toward the horizon and starting to think about the end of the semester and trying to take this opportunity to plan ahead where we can. And so this week, we're starting with assessment strategies. Um, and kind of thinking about where are we at for our final summative assessments and addressing concerns and issues related to that topic. So let's get started by using that annotation tool up here in the top left. If you click on that T, you'll open a little color bubble over to the right of that annotation panel and you can type. After you click on that T, you just click right on the screen and start typing. What are your current plans for your final summative assessments? for this semester, for spring semester. Let's start to see what people have in mind, have planned to do. Survive, great, that's a really good goal. <laughs> Final research paper, wonderful. Others. Figure out how to give a 90 minute exam in chunks, interesting. Use blended assessment strategies, a five-minute recorded presentation on a research project. Wonderful. Try and encourage randomization, quiz banks, using quiz banks, OK. An online Canvas exam, OK. Flash talks. I have an instructor doing video presentations, flash talks, OK. Uh, this red one here says, give students options for how they show their final skills. Awesome. This person here says, I'm building a curriculum for a new course for my own CNI course, my choice. Okay. All right. So basically. I'm taking it back. I, and, uh, that, and our professor um, allowed us to choose what we wanted to do for the final project. And since I already had started a curriculum, I decided to finish one. Great. Thanks for clarifying. JT, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask you to not delete these because I'm going to take a screenshot just to sort of uh, archive these um, great plans and suggestions. Sure, and keep in mind they'll also be in the recording, JT, in case you do miss something. But I will say, hey, we're about ready to move forward before I do that. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay, let's see what else. So I have here, I'm in a, in a big lecture, in my big lecture class, I've increased the percentage of low stakes quizzes and have substitute final paper for final exam. Awesome, uh, awesome pivot there is what I'll say to that. Um, give students, I already read that one. Let's see, compiled website, Google site with flash talks that can be shared with faculty friends. That's an awesome curation kind of project. I love it. Um, use blended. Did I think, I think I hit everything. All right, so JT, uh, I moved that one to Bela. You ready? Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes. All right. Okay, so lots of different ideas. I'm really inspired, first of all, to say how um, how much flexibility I'm seeing in the kind of subtext of a lot of these. Uh, and in addition to that, thinking about ways, this isn't stated explicitly, but a lot of them by their nature often are um, more personally meaningful, personally or professionally. Um, I include those together, I suppose, in terms of application kinds of things and creating projects that are unique to each individual student, which is really great for both learning as well as ensuring academic integrity. John, do you have thoughts on any of these before we move to the guiding questions for today? I just I just jumped in right now, so I haven't even had a chance to look at them, sorry. Oh, that's Sorry. all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I'm just going to give John one more second here to skim those over before I move away. And John, I know JT took a screenshot, so he could email that to you too if you wanted more time. Great. Ready to go. These look okay. good. I like a special right. the semester. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so in kind of, whereas last week we kind of had more of a presentation where we presented these top five tips and kind of talked about the, the logic and reasoning behind them, today we're taking this approach of really kind of opening up the floor and opportunity to share responses to these guiding questions. These are not, these are only guiding, right? They're to kind of get you thinking. Um, there are certainly, there's certainly a space for you to bring up whatever it is that's bothering you or you're struggling with or want some kind of uh, outside advice on or, or input. Um, but we did put together these guiding questions. What plans did you have? We kind of just talked about that. But in line with that then, do you need to revise your approach to finals? Some of you, it seems, already are revising your approach to your finals, in which case, what questions do you have, right? What what do you do? You need to run things by people to see if they make sense. That kind of thing. Um, alternatively, what concerns do you have about remote assessment, or what issues and concerns have you heard that your students are having or are worried about as they look toward finals? Um, and of course, the catch-all other questions you have about final assessments. So I think we're going to kind of do a little bit of a quick turn and move toward that activity sheet. If somebody wants to share that in the chat one more time to make sure everybody's got it, you'll notice underneath those five top tips, you get that section on what do you want to learn. That's a good place to put those questions, uh, whether they're related to the guiding questions or not. Um, those guiding questions are also at the top of that page underneath that box. It starts that paragraph in this lab. So those questions are presented there as well, so you don't have to worry about having lost them. So we'll give you all a minute uh, to either post there. You're welcome to also post in our chat if you are more comfortable just staying on this page. John is sharing the screen in our Collaborate session, so you can see that. Um, up in the top left of the Collaborate session, there is a little paper with a magnifying glass. If you click on that, you can manually zoom in further if you need to. Um, so just some, again, functionality tools there if you're unaware. All right, so we'll give you a minute to post some questions, and then we'll see what we talk about. And I want to point out that farther down below on the page, we've got um, I guess on the next page, we have a, frac a fact section of frequently asked questions. So all of the questions were from last Friday are down below. If you need a question to sort of get you thinking, or you want to hear a little bit more about one of these things, um, feel free to grab one of those and we could talk about that um, in more detail again.
So I'm just going to go ahead and start talking about one of these. Uh, it's in position six right now. Geoscience course that this person TAs. They ask students to annotate photos, draw sketches. Um, and how can I create that question in an online Canvas exam? And so one of our moderators is commenting that you can indeed attach photos, images, diagrams to Canvas questions. So essentially, if you think about uh, the question would be a, uh, I think it's called an essay question. Um, I think that's the title of it is an essay. Essay or long answer, something like that. And then basically what students get to respond to is a full text box with a rich content editor built into it. And in there, they can upload and attach files that way. And so um, the other point, so that can be done that way. The other point the moderator is making, though, is that this is an in the moment thing. Um, and so, yeah, then they're going on to say maybe ahead of time share an exam pack. So essentially what you would do is give students the task of drawing it maybe ahead of time, maybe not, I don't know, that's up to you, however you want to do it, um, or at the very least, keep in mind then that if what you were doing was a timed exam, which I wouldn't recommend in the first place, um, that's going to put a limit on how long they have to draw a diagram in the moment, right? Um, and I will speak personally as someone who is terrible at drawing even the most basic representations of things. Um, I would be highly stressed with that in an in-classroom or a remote situation um, because you also have that issue of having to take the photo and make sure you can upload it. If they're taking the exam on a laptop um, and they take something, right, I mean, you got to think about the... Um, the tech savviness that's in required here. So if I was taking the exam on a laptop and I draw something on a piece of paper, if I take a picture with my phone, now I have to know how to get it from my phone to my laptop to be able to upload into the Canvas test. So just something that I'm thinking about on the top of my head that might be in, in, introduce complications is all I'm saying. But yeah, short answer to the question is, yeah, you can definitely have them upload documents or attachments to a quiz question. Um, is there other, oh, the other thing, geoscience, the one thing I wanted to point out, um, just in case you were unaware, I'm scrolling down to right above where the frequently asked questions are on the lower part of the, the document. One of these is, and I don't know if this works for you, but I just was aware of it, so I wanted to point it out. This one here, Dr. Joseph Peterson at UW Oshkosh, he digitized common minerals, rocks, invertebrate fossil, fossils into 3D interactive PDFs. Um, and he's offered them out publicly and for use of as study aids, things like that. So again, I, geoscience is pretty general, I think. Um, so I don't know if that's something that's in your world or not, but I just figured I'd point that out. But there's also a lot of virtual lab options in here. Um, that I just want to point people to because uh, there's some really great resources. So um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out since I saw the word geoscience. Well, I wasn't even aware of that 3D PDFs were possible. That's kind of cool. I know. I didn't either. And I, 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 so full disclosure, I know Dr. Peterson. Um, I actually grew up with him, um, but he is at UW Oshkosh now. And uh, so that's how I was able to, to, be in contact with these. Um, anyway, nonetheless, the the name links to his uh, university page, and then the three D interactive PDF catalogs links to the actual document. So, and I'm wondering, if it, uh, just kind of a one off. Um, I I've seen these three D documents where it are it's a Q code, and if you have a virtual uh, or augmented reality phone that accepts, you know, who can do that can do augmented reality that's or an iPad. That's usually how those work. Uh huh. Hmm. Well, cool. I was able to do it just on my PC. So. Oh, sweet! Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I'm going to jump into number four here. Currently, the related question. Um, I broke the related question away from the number three, which was a earlier one, into separate questions, because I see it as somewhat different. Um. My understanding, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but the two-hour block um, is a thing that is there for the protection of everybody. So in case they had synchronous exams, 
you would not have the asynchronous exam at the same time somebody else would have a synchronous exam. However, you have absolutely the flexibility and right, and I would say almost, well, I'm not going to say almost responsibility, although I feel strongly about it. Um, timed exams are very difficult. Um, if you don't know what the tech and bandwidth options of your students are, some of them, keep in mind, are at home with their children right now. Um, and so forcing them to be within that two hour block to take a timed exam might be really difficult for them um, because things have changed. Their kids are no longer in school. So think about that. You don't, you can have asynchronous exams, not a problem at all. Karen, go ahead. Another technique that you can use in Canvas if you're worried about the time part, instead of having timed, how about allowing things such as not allowing the student to go back uh, to their question to answer it? How about allowing for having one question at a time pop up? So there's many options you can provide in Canvas other than timed that have the same effect but don't have the same restriction as the time issue because the time issue, as John said, is a difficult one for students. But there's many other features that you can use in Canvas, such as randomizing the questions and the question banks and doing different things that create the same type of security that maybe you're concerned about, but yet don't have the same issues of the, the time test. So we have a, a number of different suggestions in there on ways that you can utilize the Canvas quizzes to provide that type of security that that wouldn't need the timing. JT, go ahead. Hey, thanks for those suggestions, Karen. I was wondering if you could maybe address um, some of the risks that that type of exam setup could occur. So if you're not allowing students to check their work, um, would you sort of extend the amount of time that the exam is open so that time pressure doesn't exist? I just be, I mean, me being a person that has to go back and forth and freak out over an exam all the time, I would like to go back, but if that is built in constraint, how do you manage that? I would allow more time than normal. I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't set, I would, a lot of faculty that I know set maybe a day to take a quiz rather than two hours or that time block. So they would have a, any time within that day frame. Some people might take it late at night. Some people may take it later on. But allow instead of allowing for that two hour time block, it's instead put in other types of things as, as Canvas provides here. Because I think the main concern, and correct me if I'm wrong, is people are more concerned about the security of the test rather than it has to be done within a certain time frame. And for people like me who have exam anxiety, having that extra time I think is helpful. Tom, you had something oh. to add to okay. that? Tom Tobin, are you there? Mic on? Hi everybody, this is Tom Tobin from DCS. And one of the challenges that we're running into is that uh, you're, everybody's used to, if you have students with disability challenges, they have that piece of paper from McBurney that says, give me time and a half on this test. That's lowering one barrier, one time for one person. Now the assumption we have to have is all of our students have similar barriers and we've been talking about them. So uh, the, this conversation about removing time limits is a good one. And one way to continue to think about test and exam security is that you have the ability to see how much time each individual student actually does take in any given assessment. And so you have access to those analytics and people who run through a one hour exam in 15 minutes, I want to talk to those students. People who go through my one hour exam in three hours, I want to talk to them as well. But it just uh, allows you to have that conversation in a, hey, I noticed you took only a little bit of time or hey, I noticed it took you a long time. And that becomes a conversation rather than an automatic boom, 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 you know, I caught you doing something. So I just wanted to mention that the analytics can be a, uh, a backdoor or side conversation, kind of a limit where time limits might not be as effective this semester. And JT. Go ahead, JT. His thing says he's away right now. All right, um, I'm going to jump in and uh, say one more thing about the uh, different quiz options. Um, so one of the options is to not let the students go back and change their answers 
or to um, have the answers occur in a certain order so that they can't go back. Um, that goes counter, that would be so frustrating for me. It goes counter to my test taking um, quest, uh, strategies, which is to answer the questions that I can answer and then as a sort of way to warm up my brain. Um, and that might be different from the way that the instructor who's assigned the exam warms up their brain. So um, giving me as a student the agency and uh, power or control over um, how do I take the test helps me. It, it, it gives me a stronger sense of um, uh, empowerment, I guess, and uh, confidence uh, because I can answer the questions that I need and then go back and answer the questions that are harder after I've warmed up. So think about how you restrict your students taking the exams. Um, Think about how you like to take exams and say, what would it be like if somebody didn't let me take the exams the way that I want to take the exams? It might be, I mean, is, is, is your learning objective to have your student take the exam that you would take it the way that you would take it, or is it about learning the content? So things to keep in mind. All right, JT, you're back. Hey, sorry. Um, I was thinking about something that Marjean mentioned last week as um, exams as an opportunity for relearning or a sort of a learning experience. And following up on um, Karen, what you were mentioning, I was actually wondering if um, adding feedback to those types of questions is worth it in an exam. Sort of, I just I, obviously it's not a quiz, you know, sort of a final exam as well, but sort of immediate feedback on a Canvas exam that could maybe allow students who sort of are facing sort of those anxiety challenges. Is that something that anyone's ever done in the past um, in an online form? I don't know, it's just an idea. I was just thinking about that. I think it's great, especially for formative assessments. I haven't seen, I'd like to ask what other people say here about summative assessments, but it's definitely used a, a lot for formative assessments to help people learn the material. I know that there's concerns from faculty on providing that type of information if it's a if it's a summative exam, but I'd love to hear an idea that incorporates that in a summative. Has anyone here done that for a summative type exam? I guess I've always considered summative exams as formative exams as well, um, mm -hmm. where yes, I want to measure what they do, but um, I also want to give them the answers at the end of the exam. In some ways, it just shortens the feedback loop so that mm -hmm. they're not taking the exam and forgetting about it. But they take the exam, they can immediately see the answers, um, and that reinforces their learning. Whether they got the question right or wrong, I will still give them feedback on, on it and redirect them to the correct answer. Tom. And just a quick reminder for everybody that uh, this really is a conversation. Uh, we're really grateful to have your questions in the activity sheet, but uh, if you want to join the conversation and share your experiences, if you're doing something that we're talking about or you've experienced uh, you know, anything with your students this semester, put a hand up and we'll give you the mic and we'd love to make this a conversation. Go ahead, Marjean. <clears throat> just, <clears throat> excuse me, just to piggyback on um, what J JP said and kind of what Karen said as far as summative assessments, my question would be, is to, in terms of summative assessments, what exactly do you want to assess? So if you do need to assess automaticity, right? So a quick retrieval of, of memorized information, that's, that's one thing, but if it's, uh, but if that's not necessary, I still I'm still kind of okay with people open book test as a summative assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Marjean. That's always the topic I bring up to, or the question I bring up to when I talk with people about assessment, whatever it is. It's always, well, what's your goal? What are you trying to do? What do you want the outcome to be? Um, and so I think that's always a good place to start. And just a, a note on that, um, even if your exam is for quick retrieval, consider, is it quick retrieval, like is the online space the an authentic 
representation of that quick retrieval um, or is quick retrieval often, I guess I'm thinking about the situated context, right? Um, when we are retrieving things, it's usually within a problem or within a problem space. And is the online space an accurate representation of that uh, problem situation or that context? Um, I'm thinking if, if in a, a medical uh, exam, for example, in real life, I would be inside of say hospital room and there'd be people around me and there'd be all kinds of cues for me as well. In an online space, there aren't those things. So how can you create those uh, cues or context, contextual cues for that? Thomas, Tom. Thanks, John. And uh, one other thing that we can add into this, and I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts here, our friends in the psychology department talk about a concept called construct relevance. And that means, are you actually testing your students on the things that you are grading them on and as few other things as possible? The classic example is if you're teaching a mathematics course and you're getting into higher level mathematical notation and you give students a word problem and ask them to create the mathematical notation from that word problem, what you're actually testing them on is not their mathematical notation skills, but their math notation and their reading comprehension skills. So if you're using concepts or words with which they're not familiar, you know, the whole two trains leave cities at different speeds kind of a problem, that is a challenge for some people, not because they don't know the math, but because they don't have the linguistic or reading comprehension skills. One of the constructs that uh, we all work within is the physical classroom and the number of minutes that we have scheduled for our classes. So how would you assess your students' learning if those things didn't apply? And that's a, a, a kind of a freeing question as well and not a limiting one. Frank, would you mind if uh, I ask you, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I was curious then since you're a math instructor and we were just pointing that out after a major exam, you know, on obviously you provide the probably the correct answer. How do you handle providing answers to questions for, for math exams? Uh, do you provide the answer after all the exams are completed? Yep, that's what we do. Great. Right. Yeah. Typically what I'll do is actually give them a, um, an idea what the exam is going to look like beforehand. So give them a practice exam as well. So that at least they've got a certain, in other words, I'm not going to blindside them with new stuff. Good. And that's Thank you for typical sharing. in the department. Well. All right. In the chat, Michelle asks, quick retrieval, could the assessment be students submit the recall strategies? For example, they submit a, a pack of digital class uh, flashcards or a DIY, DIY glossary created with Google Doc. Um, just an idea. And I, I, I saw that and I love it because it's students submitting and sharing, I'm, I'm hoping, sharing with each other at some point um, what they work, how they learn. Um, and I think that we can talk till we're blue in the space about uh, learning science and distributed cognition and all of these uh, different concepts that are research supported um, for students to learn. But more often than not, they will just talk to the person, well, usually down the hallway from the residence hall uh, room. But now they've got GroupMe, they've got, um, WhatsApp, they've got all of these other informal connections that they're saying, how are you learning these things? If we can formalize that so that they aren't just connecting within their small um, peer groups, but can share what they're learning with the rest of the classroom, that would be fantastic, a fantastic way. Um, plus it gets them thinking about how they learn and thinking about how it's not just going to help them for this one exam or in this one class, but in their whole, um, their whole uh, career as a student and as a person. Good idea, Michelle. All right, JT. I was wondering if the participant who, oh, I have been kicked out. Um, the participant who, who wrote that they were doing um, blended assessment strategies. 
um, it was using blended assessment strategies on the um, the whiteboard. If they'd be if they'd be willing to share what some of those examples look like for people who maybe are just not as familiar with what that necessarily means, um, and especially for the flash talks, just as an example of what that looks like. Good question. Yeah, what are blended assessment strategies in this context? or anybody else who has an idea of what blended assessment strategies are. Karen, go ahead. Well, I do is, you know, able to, to share with us more. But my first thought was some kind of asynchronous prepared artifact of sorts, whatever that might be, and then something that might be synchronous, like uh, a group presentation or some kind of oral exam or demonstration um, of something in real time. That would be my thought. And I see we have a question on the bottom I will pull up as well. Um, and we'll just move this up. Go ahead, Thomas. I was just going to add with uh, blended assessment strategies, one of my favorite things to do is figure out what I absolutely need my students to demonstrate to me while I'm observing them or under controlled conditions versus what are the pieces of knowledge that they can demonstrate on their own time, bring it back to me later, take it home and work on it. And I've often taken my final examinations and started to chunk them up in that way. So instead of having a 90 minute final exam that covers absolutely everything, what are the things where I can just trust that my students are gonna do the individual work? And uh, you know, if they have their books open or resources available, then that's either okay or even encouraged. And then I shift that into, please do this on your own and bring it back to me in some fashion, like using the assessments tool, or, uh, or excuse me, the assignment tool in Canvas to have them just upload content for me to review to make sure, check mark, yes, they know it, versus here's the stuff that they really have to demonstrate and I have to have some control over the circumstances. And uh, that's been my guiding way of thinking about blended assessment for a very long time. And I'll, I'll, I'll do some research while you are talking about other things and I'll post some links into the activity document too. All right, and JT, jump in. Hey, Tom, that's a really good example. And I was wondering, um, if you could give an example from your background, what that um, sort of controlled um, demonstration of knowledge would look like, or for what purpose? I'm coming from a foreign language background, so obviously um, the, the ability of an individual or individuals to communicate with each other um, sort of in a live setting is something that's very important. I think video uploads could be something that you know could be that sort of external chunked piece of the assessment strategy but in your ex experiences what has been that live or sort of you are the the observer what, what was that thanks jt and, and good question to clarify uh, i teach english composition courses educational technology courses leadership courses and uh, i was a math instructor for a hot minute back in the day so in all of those instances, uh, what I'm looking for is the stuff that can't be, uh, to get into the academic integrity concern for a second here, what's the stuff that has to be unfakeable? Right? What's the stuff where students absolutely must demonstrate? So your example of teaching a language course and actually hearing the students demonstrating uh, fluency in the spoken language. My question there is, okay, if I have a student who has a speech disfluency or other uh, disability barrier, what's the alternate to somebody who can't speak or can't speak well to be able to demonstrate that speech fluency? And we talk about that all the time with students who have disability barriers and disability accommodations. So the unfakeable thing in that regard is comprehension of the language and being able to translate it uh, quickly into something that is useful. So in that case, I might say the unfakeable thing is demonstration of language comprehension. So here's a passage, please translate this into Spanish uh, and, you, and show me how you've done that by uploading a video of yourself or an audio recording of you yourself speaking it. Or the alternate is I've set up this Canvas 
activity or assessment where you have a, a timed, and here's one of the few places where I'll say, please use a timer, you know, read this paragraph and key in a timed response of your own translation. The only reason I would use a timer is if one of the alternatives wasn't timed. So uh, for something like a, an English literature or English composition course that I taught, one of the things that I would move away from an uh, exam situation would be doing drafting or creating a large essay or course project. And then inside the exam situation, I would ask students about uh, what are the five key elements of an APA citation? And they would have to know that content and information. And that's one of those, you know it or you don't, uh, kind of unfakeable kind of things. So I, I hope that gets a, a couple of examples out there. And I'd love to hear other examples from everybody who's on the conversation. What are the unfakeable things? What are the things that students must demonstrate to you? And then conversely, what are the things that they could go off and do on their own? And you'd still accept that as proof of their skill, even if it's not under controlled circumstances. So I'd love to open it up to everybody else. Put your hands up, key into the chat, um, key into the document. And when JT said, give us an example, he didn't mean one per group. That was like from everybody, come on. So one of the things that, go ahead, Duncan, jump in. I'm just reflecting. Um, thanks everybody, I'm a little late. I, I try to have different assessments for different learning goals not just a comprehensive midterm and final that kind of covers the whole class. Many of those are formative and involve, uh, I try to make them involve a student product. So for example, I saw I'm teaching physics and the computational element, they have to give me a script, an executed script, and it's well commented in law tech explaining what it's doing. Uh, and then of course the results, the, the lab component, they submit images, they submit their plots, they submit a product um, to demonstrate what they've done. Then my, there's a whole kind of concepts, formulas, theories, applications aspect, the traditional aspect of physics that I tend to think of as content knowledge, broadly speaking. Um, and they're, uh, so I'm just writing you know, a, a second exam right now for for that, and it's it's just focused on that aspect, the, the, their ability to uh, solve an integrated problem, and also they're just kind of short answer questions and making sure that they've um, touched some of the concepts. I can't in an exam test them comprehensively on the content even close. It's just not possible and, and not sensible. Uh, but it, I restrict that assessment to this sort of specific learning goal and it's only one of uh, half a dozen. So I think in a, in a blended context, the more one has, call them formative assessments and then address specific things uh, and that involve the student producing a product. The, the example of a quick translation in language and there's a product and there's a time associated with it, you know, I get that, that's, that's perfect. Uh, um, if you have other learning goals in a language course that might involve culture or uh, who knows, um, that could, might be assessed in an entirely different way. But, but maybe, a, maybe a thought um, to share would be to try to segment the assessments and uh, not make them uh, have a, kind of a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. That, uh, comprehensive exam that asks about history and culture and concepts and demonstrates language and you know blah blah blah, blah. that's probably, probably way too much uh, that's all I got so I, I want to just give a, a plus one to the student product um, one of the things that I, I have my students build a canvas course now I'm teaching educational technology and they've 
a lot of them are graduate students and um, instructors who need to build a Canvas course. They've had a, a course that uh, they can see a way to improve it. So I say, just go ahead and build it. This is their course. There are no two courses that are the same. There's no way that they can um, copy that uh, for each other because it takes on the personality. It takes on them thinking about how would I apply this as, as an instructor. Um, when I would teach freshmen, um, we would give them a project to think about where are you going with your life? What are you going to do in the next four years that you're here um, at UW-Madison? And what are the, what is the what is your path going to look like? And it's not going to be the same as what other people's path looks like. So, um, in that way, whatever they put into that product will ideally pull in from the classes that they're currently taking, get them thinking about the future classes that they will be taking. Um, but each one is very individualized, um, and yet within that individualized thing, there are some broad assessments that I can do. Um, as far as a rubric, you know, are they showing examples? Are they citing relevant sources, et cetera, et cetera? So there's a lot of variability within that individual. Um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of uniformity within, as far as assessment is concerned, within that variable uh, individual assessments that, that happen. Very good. Karen. So I just wanted to share, and hopefully that's the jets are done taking off. Um, there's usually three or four. I've already heard three go by. So if I suddenly mute, it's because an F-16 is flying over. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Oh, right. I wanted to share an example of uh, an assessment strategy that I observed during my dissertation work. Um, and basically, the... The now granted this is from a fully online course, so there's that to consider, but each unit was split into two two week. Um, let me start over. Each unit was occurred over two weeks. And during a two week unit, the first week was um if y'all are familiar with the absorb do connect framework, absorb is learn new material, do is uh, work with that material in some way, applying it, what have you, um, and connect is to find ways to um, connect it with other material and or personal experiences, that kind of thing. So put simply. So the first week of the two week unit would be independent, absorb, and some do kinds of things. And so one of the do things was a, uh, what was called an individual readiness assessment test, IRAT. Um, and every student went through the instructional material. There were other activities too, but then they filled out this IRAT, the individual test, and it was basically, it, it's more complicated this, but I want to keep it simple. It was basically a really difficult five question multiple choice quiz. Um, and so it was really high level question styles. And then the second week of the unit, it was team-based learning. And so during the first week, students worked by themselves. They did that IRAT. And then the second week, there was a discussion as well as the students were in small groups. And then they did the team readiness assessment test, or the TRAT. And so in the team one, it was the same questions, but now they had to work together to determine, all right, which, which answers really are the best answers here. Um, so it was a way to first get students learning independently and assessing their individual knowledge and then shifting to a more collaborative effort to um, to to fill that same thing out as a as a team. So anyway, just a kind of different approach to assessment. Um, and that would just was something that went throughout the whole term. There was no final cumulative uh, summative. Assessment. It was just all breaking, broken up into units like that. Go ahead, JT. Thanks. I just wanted to ask, um, I guess, everyone and some of the um, participants that are also on the call, if the transition to sort of this online environment has um, caused them to go in between different options and they're still sort of mulling how best to finish the semester. Or do they still want to go um, <laughs> towards maybe a final exam or are they, are they interested in um, 
doing sort of more piecemeal type um, exam strategies that we've um, sort of been discussing just to kind of get a lay of the land. If there's anyone that would, you know, would like to share sort of where their department is or what they um, are experiencing, um, I think that'd be great to hear as well. Yeah. Uh, hi. Well, uh, I'm teaching a, a large lecture class. Uh, it's not that large, but 117 students. And and I basically my problem is that my problem, uh, my objective is to to test critical thinking and how to assess critical thinking. And for that number of, st of students is, 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 is a problem in terms of my time. So what I've been doing is, well, first I, I eliminated the final exam because again, I, I, I freak out a little bit. So I increase the percentage uh, of the grade for the final paper that my TAs will, will grade. And then I've been also increasing the percentage of these low stakes quizzes that they are they are graded surveys. They will get the point or the half a point just for doing it. And the questions are are there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, basically, they they have three choices. And then my instant feedback uh, that a paragraph that I have prepared addressed right that addressed that. So well, you chose this is because you are putting more emphasis on this thing. Number two and number three are connected. So it's a kind of a dialogue in which I'm not present, but it's my voice. My only problem is I don't know if they're reading that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if, I mean, I, I say, please yeah, read my comments after you submit the, the quiz because you are getting the points anyway, but I want you to, to realize what choices you made and why and, and dialogue with me. But again, I, unless I do a follow up to that, I don't have a, a, a way to, to check if they are really uh, engaging with me in that way. That's, that's my experience. So we have a um, we had an active teaching lab um, now it's going on two years ago where we addressed this um, issue in some ways with audio comments and what we had uh, an instructor come in and talk about was how at the exams instead of typing in all of his um, feedback to the students and hoping that they would go back and check the feedback and hoping that they would understand the feedback as positive rather than like, oh, you did this wrong, red pen, red pen, red pen. He took his phone and used the record function, the audio record function, and he would, on a screen, go in and read through the paper while he was saying, okay, I see in paragraph one, you set up a great topic uh, introduction here. Um, one concern that I have is da 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 da. And so he would give the audio file then back as his feedback. One of the cool things about this is that um, you can't scan an audio file. Another cool thing, so the students would sort of take it and read through their paper with the audio file uh, back in, in, as they're listening to the voice. And that's the second point. The audio, our voices, give such rich feedback, right? And that we can reassure the, our students that we're not being angry at them or calling them stupid by saying, I like what you did here. I have concerns about this. I hear it in my voice that I'm not angry or accusing you of being dumb with that. So that was a really good way, I thought. And the students he reported back really appreciated that. We think about this as instructors anyway. And that narrative that goes through our brain then, we have to translate into the written response. He just skips out that translation, and he just follows the narrative in his brain as he goes through it. Um, but that was a really good thing. So Marjean, can you talk about your experience with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, it's pretty cool. My, my dissertation advisor will read through my um, copy, uh, whatever I've been working on. Um, and as she's going through it, she does a screen, kind of a screen capture of the paper as it's going along. and will use highlight tools or make comments, but at the same time, um, explain her comments in more depth. And so it becomes a little bit more of a conversation so that when we do meet face to face, 
you kind of have some background information. So it's kind of like this blended, so it's not quite assessment, but it's kind of a blended feedback model. Oh, <laughs> Karen in the chat said, students can respond to your students in speed grader. And I was like, yeah, plus one on speed on, uh, on, on, on setting up peer feedback options, because there is a good chance that they will listen to each other um, just as well as they listen to you. Uh, but she meant students can respond to feedback, so you can actually have that conversation back and forth. You can have audio. They can give audio feedback to your audio feedback as well. Um, there's another in business instructor that I remember hearing. Um, he would talk about the, he would create a video that talked about the common um, errors or common issues that his students had in covering an assignment. So he would read through the assignment, he would give individual written feedback, but then he would create a video for the whole class saying, here are some of the big issues that I've seen. A lot of you did this, many of you did this, some of you did this. Um, instead, think about some of this other thing. Some of you did a really good job by showing X, Y, and Z. So that was a, a, a really nice way for him to sort of address these issues just once in a video, rather than repeating that feedback individually to many people. Um, so that's one thought. Alyssa, you have a, a thought. Yeah, hi, thanks guys. I wanna thank everybody for being here today and um, all of your suggestions and thoughts. Um, I'm coming from the Department of French and Italian and I have more so a comment on something that uh, Juan said that struck me um, and then I'll kind of piggyback off of that with a question. Um, but Juan mentioned the time constraints that come along with some of the alternative options to assessment that he had been considering. Um, and that really resonated with me because in the French department, um, we are facing that challenge. How do we assess um, a student's listening skills and also their language skills, their speaking skills? Um, and so we kind of were bouncing ideas around in terms of having um, instructors and TAs um, carry out individual Skype interviews in uh, the language with the students. Um, but I do think that the question of time um, that some of these alternative options require as opposed to the traditional exam that we would see in the classroom um, is a challenge that has been presented. And I guess that's just sort of a comment. And I wonder if anyone else has thoughts or ideas um, on how they have addressed the that question. Um, and then sort of a separate question that it looks like perhaps you, you guys may have addressed last week in your active teaching lab. Um, and, and it's kind of discussed so far in today's session. Um, is the question of academic integrity um, and putting an exam online. So in our department, um, or at least I'll say for some of the introductory level courses, we have an exam that sort of gets recycled. And so the material never leaves the classroom um, and it, it never goes home with the students. And we are able to kind of strictly regulate how the information is handled. And the fear of putting some of those things online, um, even in a Canvas quiz format, is that students can screenshot the exam and so we were kind of looking for alternatives. How do we, um, unless we're using proctoring software, things like that, um, how can we do that without needing to scratch the entire exam and, and rewrite it? Go ahead, Tom. Hi, Lisa. This is Tom. And uh, academic integrity is one of those things where can, can I be real blunt? I, when I first started teaching online 22 years ago, we went through all of these questions. And so we've actually got decades of good practices that can help us to keep the integrity of our exams high without causing undue anxiety and stress for our students. You're absolutely correct that students can take screenshots, but if you're using something like proctoring software or turn it in or, or those kinds of things, there's lots of ways to get around that too. So the big thing that we do is we try to, one, reduce the temptation to cheat by reducing the things that could cause anxiety and stress. And we've actually talked about a bunch of them. One of them is removing time limits. One of them is breaking up large assessments into smaller pieces, even if they are high stakes. The second part of that is if you create an exam in uh, Canvas, for example, Canvas allows you to randomize the order of the questions and randomize any answer 
uh, possibilities if you have things like multiple choice questions so that no two students will see the same questions in the same order. It also allows you to pool questions. This gets at more of the medium level strategies that are in that activity document. So if you have a particular objective that you would like students to, uh, to demonstrate, you want them to understand the uses of the infinitive in French, you can put four or five different questions on the uses of the infinitive into a uh, test bank, and then it will serve up one of those from the test bank on that particular objective. And so no two students, even if they were sitting next to one another or taking screenshots, would have the same experience. So what you're doing is you're not preventing dishonest conduct, but you're making it much harder to be dishonest and share, hey, did you get what you, what was your answer for number four? Because their number four not, might not be your number four, and it might not even be the same question. Granted, this all takes time and this all takes effort to set up, but the silver lining is if you do put in that effort, then the exam that you've created, you can use that for years and years and years down the line because that pooling and that randomization, that's a wonderful academic integrity strategy. So I hope I've been able to at least get in the neighborhood of addressing your question. And Alyssa in the chat says, that all sounds great, thank you, so awesome. And come back on the, the, the voice line too if you have other ideas or, or share how you're actually doing it in your department too. Yeah, for now in our department, I think we've kind of, uh, similar to what Juan has done, um, we have chosen to redistribute points, um, percentage points of the final grade that were originally attributed to the um, exam, and we've kind of substituted um, some other activities that have been added um, and um, assigned those percentage points to other areas um, such as either smaller quizzes or um, additional homework assignments that have been um, assigned kind of things like that so that's currently how how we are working through it and that's an excellent first step toward lowering anxiety and pressure so that that more than using proctoring or turn it in that actually reduces academic dishonesty by a large chunk and we've got lots of research data that backs that up so you guys are on a good path there and another thing is to, to recognize that you can't do it all at once. So this is going to be a transition. Just as you know, we, we transitioned very quickly to remote instruction, um, but we are still using a lot of the strategies that we had in face-to-face -face, um, instruction. And it's going to take some time to redesign the courses um, to be more robust for both or either format. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen in fall. I know that summer's going to be all online. Um, but as you consider what you're doing for the rest of this semester, you might even start thinking ahead to, what is this going to look like in fall? How can I do it even better in fall? And starting to move from those single exams to more and more of the, what can we do asynchronously in smaller chunks, both for bandwidth, for lowered stress for everybody, you and as well as the students, and for better learning, um, via distributed learning versus masked learning. Um, these are all good things. It is 11.04 and what we had hoped to do is spend that first hour um, focusing sort of on what we have been focusing and then this last hour from 11 to 11.30 on individual questions and maybe more in-depth um, Q&A, I guess, uh, problems that you might not have thought, oh, I'll bring it up with, I don't want to bring it up with everybody, but maybe I can just bring it up in a, a conversation afterwards. Now is the afterwards, so stick around if you want to be involved in those conversations. If you don't and you've gotten a lot out of this already, please feel free to, to, to leave us. <laughs>